See, you were almost the living example of our show title, Mr. Kane. <laughs> yeah. It's all good. It's all good. Nothing to see here. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, I, I ought to know better than to keep that whiskey mug that close to the mic boom. Oh, I don't think we can ever be too close to that fuse box authorized and highly collectible whiskey mug, sir. Available now at thefuseboxshow.com and clicking the swag tab. Well, luckily, it was empty. <laughs> Good lad. (laughs) And you may finally be hearing the bell that's tolling for thee. I did absolutely nothing wrong. I mean, absolutely. Remind me to not be anywhere that bell rings at noon. Uh, uh, Hello, friends, and uh, welcome in to this, indeed, the 251st edition of Fusebox, calamitously entitled Banjaxed, and I'll tell you about that title in a bit. I'm your uh, fully in sync, but still missing a few frames, host Mark Rose, and over there... Inching ever closer to that whiskey mug. <laughs> A respectable distance, bro. <laughs> is the monarch of the multi band compressor, Milt Keynes, everybody. Thank you, Kylie. Uh, so, uh, band jaxed? Ah, uh, yes. This is a great word that uh, comes from Irish slang. And it uh, means something that is broken, ruined, confounded, or shattered. Huh. Yeah, world slang is just wonderful. And as uh, anybody knows who's been with us over these past 10 years, I'm very fond of these terms, uh, wherever they come from. This one was suggested, albeit unbeknownst to him, by uh, Neil from Ireland, who has a remarkably delightful show called Into Your Head which uh, we'll link to in the show description uh, for you to check out. Neil has been at this a while, too. Uh, I I guess maybe nearly two decades, I think. Yeah. And uh, I'm a big fan of his shows and uh, listened to him for years. And in uh, one of his many delightful, absurdist monologues, he was talking about the dangers of being swallowed by a whale, which was then swallowed by... Another whale, which was then swallowed by, yet again, another whale. But uh, this last whale wasn't really hungry. He said the uh, fate of the swallowy was probably banjaxed, which uh, delighted me no end. <laughs> <laughs> Threw down your glass of pink unicorn and ran to the dictionary. <laughs> Uh, green fairy, Mr. Keynes, green fairy. But yes, yes, I immediately ran to the uh, dictionary to uncover its origins and uh, found the aforementioned meanings, which, uh, as we know, is a uh, perfect summation for the unraveling of a certain former president who, uh, as we said at the top of the show, uh, will come to hear the tolling of the bell. Yeah. Yeah. With him as the human clapper. And we don't mean uproarious applause, friends. Uh, So more about that uh, coming up. Yes, and but also, we feature a chat I had with 42nd Street Pete on the passing of a film giant who really kick-started the careers of more iconic uh, directors and actors and film production technicians than virtually anyone in our film history. Harvey Weinstein? Uh, no. He certainly had an influence. (laughs) So, uh, stay with us, friends. We'll be back in a flash. Or... 
are they? Now we will leave the air. Just want to take a pause in the proceedings here to let you know about our friends at Grindhouse Resurrection Magazine, the premier source of all things uh, Grindhouse. In issue number two, one of my all-time favorite guilty pleasures, a film called Street Trash, directed by Jim Murrow, is featured in great detail by a guy who should know he was in it. Mike Lackey, who played Fred the Bum in this glorious melt movie from 1987. A mysterious beverage appears on Skid Row called Tenafly Viper, and when consumed has, uh, shall we say, a disastrous aftertaste. In glorious, oversaturated color. It's what makes Grindhouse Resurrection a valuable resource, friends. Articles written by the folks who were there, and like in Mike's case here, were a part of it. 96 pages of glossy goodness in each issue and not a speck of cereal. Check it out in the link in the show description. Grindhouse Resurrection Magazine. Better than a subpoena. TheFuseBoxShow.com Well, welcome back, friends. So once again, we uh, really, really can't ignore the events of the past days as the former president of these here somewhat, perhaps on occasion, United States, was uh, convicted of 34 counts of, well, call it what it is, fraud. He is officially a convicted felon. True. One that, uh, by the way, cannot vote in his current home, as it turns out. Yeah, probably be one or nine other states where a felon cannot vote as well. Yeah, there there are several for sure. Of course, as we know, he's going to appeal this verdict. And, of course, use this opportunity to grift more of his Kool-Aid drunken supporters. Already has. He's collected something like uh, $38 million, and, and, and that was just uh, right after the verdict. Yeah, not wasting any time. No, no, he's certainly not. Uh, as we pointed out in the last show, this uh, sham casting by uh, legacy media, trying to give the impression that uh, there was some kind of aha moment in the uh, cross-examination of Michael Cohen, which was complete rubbish. And the jurors were clearly not at all convinced by the defense's attempt of uh, trying to destroy the credibility of Michael Cohen. Whose testimony, by the way, had already been fully corroborated by 21 other witnesses. Now, the exploding banana here could still be the Supreme Court. Oh, how, how so? Well, as we know, they seem to be lately living in the upside down, where three plus two equals penguin. Right. Well, what if these whack bats step up and reverse decisions? Because they seem to be, like, working for Orange Guy's defense team lately. Well, I, I, to be honest with you, it would take something like a constitutional breach to get them involved. First of all, this, of course, is a state case, not federal. They, they really have no jurisdiction there. Yeah, but what about that whole uh, Colorado thing, you know? The Supreme Court of Colorado ruled that the uh, Orange Guy was indeed an insurrectionist and barred him from the ballot only to be reversed by the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, that's kind of what I'm saying. The, the reason that uh, this was even heard by the Supreme Court was that it was a possible infringement of constitutional law. Now, in their view, <laughs> misguided as it was, they said you can't do that because you'd be creating a uh, chaotic event stream where each state could potentially have different folks on the ballot, and that would cause confusions. Huh. Well, I see that, but I uh, sure think we need some kind of provision to keep would-be dictators off the damn ballot. And there is the conundrum in our system, Mr. Keynes. It's uh, truly up to the voters to prevent these subhuman types from getting into the system. Has been for over 200 years. Yeah, well, then there you go. More reasons to get the hell out and vote this year. Certainly will be our message here at the show. I, I really don't think we're going to see any apathy at the polls this time. Yeah, you might see tactics employed by some magonoids to uh, prevent you from voting. So I say... 
carry a bigger club. You know, speaking of that, I, I want to commend uh, Judge Juan Mershon for his in- incredible fairness and outright patience above and beyond the call of duty here. He and uh, his family, most specifically his daughter, have, have been uh, repeatedly the targets of this orange guy's rage. And uh, gag orders notwithstanding, has shown the inner strength and uh, uh, commitment to the rule of law through it all. Yeah, and I got to wonder, at the time of sentencing, which will be another historical minute, how much of that repeated violation of the 10-plus gag orders will factor into his sentence? Or ones to follow, because you know he can't stop. His lawyers have warned him repeatedly to be mindful uh, of what you say, but the orange guy ain't having it, you know? The narcissism is too, ooh, here comes that word, malignant to keep in check. That and the fact that he needs to act like that in order to continue to grift his Maganoid supporters. Yeah, good point. You know, I've had this theory for a while about how these court cases might actually play out. Oh, yeah? Yeah, like, I'm betting he does not get reelected. Uh, there will be, you know, Maganoids uprising about all of that. But as he starts to fade from the daily news feed, which will eventually happen, then... When eyes are focused, you know, elsewhere, maybe Biden's laptop, each one of these stalled cases will become unstalled and he will be slammed one after another until he's orange paste. You think? I do. It's kind of how things are sometimes, you know? Lots of stuff happens super quick when the eyes of the world aren't uh, staring at every move. Well... It certainly would be my happy place, for sure. (laughs) Because let me tell you something, and and I will go on record with this very statement. You're uh, actually a Martian? Heaven forfend, Mr. Keynes. Arcturus, actually. (laughs) No, I would not spend one further minute in a country that installed this guy again. Not one second. It would be a sign that the uh, blind stupidity is in a much bigger percentage in this country than the one-third we already know about. No, I hear you. No, I, I, I actually have faith, not hope, that that eventuality will not come to be. It's been clearly demonstrated over the last couple of elections, so... You know, I think we should also commend the jury here, too, yeah? I mean, talk about pressure. Oh, they were all over it and listened intently, took the evidence, and made a unanimous decision of guilty on all 34 counts. Now, some of these folks, as you might imagine, have already been in the Maganoid sites for uh, retribution. No, sir. I didn't like it. Well, and, and here's a little extra thing to chew on. Um, the, in, in one of these recent, a uh, couple of these recent polls, one in particular here, this is fascinating to me. of registered GOP voters say they are now less likely to vote for him. More startlingly, 8% of those identifying as Trump supporters and 15% of registered GOP voters say he should drop out of the presidential race. Now, these are from separate polls, uh, one by Ipsos for uh, Reuters and uh, the other one by Morning Consult. Now, as you may recall, based on Trump's uh, 2020 vote totals, each percentage point of voters who peel away from him would cost Trump roughly 750,000 votes and two to three electoral college votes. Well... That could sink them. One would think. The show for everybody, but not everybody will like it. Fuse Box. Well, friends... Let's close out the proceedings here with a uh, a delightful chat I had with our buddy, 
42nd Street Pete concerning the recent passing of a film icon. Producer, writer, editor, uh, even an actor at one point, Roger Corman, who uh, left this particular reel at age 98, but left an amazing legacy of work and helped start the careers of people you definitely know. Let me just say this, that there has been absolutely no word. I mean, crickets when it comes to the story of Roger Corman and uh, anything this this guy has, has done to advance the careers of some of the biggest names in film. Yeah, somebody, I, I, I had said something about this, I think on Facebook, and I might have even said it on the YouTube channel. And, you know, when I got back, what did you expect? Is that what they said? Well, no. Well, I, just people in general. It's it's yeah. like, all right, just take a guy like LQ, LQ Jones. How much stuff was he in? TV series, movies, yeah. directing, writing. Guy was 92 years old. He passed away. Not even a blip on the radar. Yeah. But Quentin Tarantino farts or something like that. Yeah, this is big news. <laughs> but. And he was, uh, Roger was 98, which yeah. is amazing. Because some of the more recent interviews I've, I saw with him within the last five or six years, he looked great. And, and, you know, the, the thing about it is, you know, he was still working. He was up you to know, the Quentin last. Tarantino, I, I'm, I'm quitting after my 10th my movie. I, I'm so <laughs> wonderful. And like, this guy never stopped. He started in like, what, 52? I think it was mo a Monster from the Ocean Floor and then never stopped. Well, he, you know, he got his first gig at uh, the 20th Century Fox in the mailroom, which is the classic story, right? And then he worked his way up into the uh, to, to being a story reader for the studio. And the, one of the little anecdotes I read that was amazing. I did not know this. He contributed ideas to this film called The Gunfighter with uh, Gregory Peck. Right. And he, he got kind of torqued because they never credited him as as being, you know, material supplied, which was pretty typical for Hollywood back then. And then he just said, hey, yeah, goodbye. Went on his own and, and uh, you know, went to Oxford University, got degrees in English and all this stuff. So this guy was a very learned chap. He, he was also a visionary, too. Yeah. Really was. I mean, you know, I'll go my my whole my my discovery of Roger Corman came uh, going back. It had to be the sixties. Mm -hmm. Channel Seven used to have this thing, the Big Show, at four o'clock. Right it's after mm -hmm. school, and you know, it was themed. One one day was westerns, one day was war movies, one day was monsters, one day was whatever. Well, I come home to see this movie, the day the world ended, and this is during the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> so this is the atomic war, TD Day, total destruction for nuclear, or whatever. This thing scared the fuck out of me. Mm -hmm. And at the end, Roger Corman. So the name stuck with me, and I equated, you know, as a kid. Anything AIP was Roger Corman. Right. But then after I saw The Day the World Ended, there was this thing, I think I talked about it on, on YouTube, thing called Million Dollar Movie. Mm -hmm. And it was on Channel 9 in New York, and they basically ran the same movie at 8 o'clock every night for a whole week. <laughs> Attack of the Crab Monsters. Oh. Who could not love Attack of the Crab Monsters? Perfect. Yeah, now I discover more of him, and it's like, okay, some of my favorite movies were basically Roger Corman's early stuff, like The Undead, mm -hmm. the Bridley Murphy thing that they basically shot in an abandoned supermarket or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And then, then, then there was you know the whole development of Corman's like stock company, like mm -hmm. uh, you know Dick Miller, who became yep. famous for cameos. Jonathan Hayes, Mel Wells, Richard Devon, Richard Garland, Beverly Garland, mm -hmm. uh, Susan Cabot, a yeah. ton of people. Yeah, These, yeah, and, and they were so iconic. I mean, I loved, yeah. uh, I think I saw a Little Shop of Horrors way back in the... In the uh, yeah, I forgot Jack Nicholson and Mel Wells. Yes, uh, in the mid-60s, and I just loved Fred Katz's score. I thought this was, who is this guy? So I, you know, I had to start looking him up, but the, the whole, even though he had low budget motif going there, he never made it look that way. He, he, they, no. they put time and effort into this stuff, regardless what the genre was. It never looked like that. And his Poe stuff is still regarded these days as being some of the finest adaptations, uh, albeit loosely, of uh, some of that work and wonderfully photographed. By some pretty well, sophisticated yeah. people. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Danny Haller was in there. Yes. Cinematographer. Um, then the other thing, too, was... Now, here's something that people don't pick up on. In the 50s, he took two guys that were basically career studio heavies 
and gave them lead roles. Mm -hmm. Charles Bronson and Machine Gun Kelly and Lee Van Cleef and it conquered the world. There you go. So he saw the potential there already. Yeah. Yeah, he was, I mean, he had an eye. I mean, look, for, in case people don't know, here's just a very short list of people who have been, who have benefited from the guidance of Roger Corman. Let's start with Francis Coppola, yeah. Martin Scorsese, Ron Howard, Peter Bogdanovich, Paul Bartel, Jonathan Demme, James Cameron. The list just goes on and on and on and on. And then, then the actors, I mean, you know. Yep. Bruce Byrne, Peter mm -hmm. Fonda, Dennis Hopper, Michael J. Pollard to a certain extent. And then, you know, even when he went on, like I, I think his first outside of AIP studio film was uh, St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Mm -hmm. And that was for Columbia. And he brought it in on time and under budget. Yeah. But the cool thing was he gave almost all his stock guys little roles. Like Dick Miller and Jonathan Hayes were in there. Dick Miller was one of, one of the killers. Mm -hmm. Leo Gordon, who he had he collaborated with a lot, was uh, one, one of the hoods. Mm. Um, Jack Nicholson was the guy sitting in the back going with, hey, you're going to rub the garlic on the bullets. It gives them blood poisoning. <laughs> and Betsy Jones Moreland. So, you know, he took care of his stock guys. Yeah, he had an ensemble. And then, you know, the other thing was, you know, he, he, the, the quirky stuff that he did, going down to Puerto Rico and shooting three films. Mm -hmm. You know, Last Woman on Earth with... Basically a cast of three people. Right. One of them who was Robert Town, the writer. Right, right. The other one who was Anthony Caruso, who, you know, played gangsters all the time and wound up a lot on the Abbott and Costello show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then, you know, then the creature from the Haunted Sea, which was completely insane. Mm-hmm. I think it was, it was the one, Battle of the Bloody Beach. It's interesting to me to note how he parlayed his 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 own film distributing company in, into various uh, forms. I mean, this guy was wheeling and dealing from like 1955. Oh yeah, well you know the whole the whole thing was the the Philippine thing. Yeah. Um, what happened was you know all right, John Ashley had worked for AIP, so obviously they knew each other. So Ashley's over there doing the Blood Island stuff for Hemisphere, mm -hmm. and he must have got a hold of Corman and said, look, we can shoot a lot of shit here cheap. So that's when him and Eddie Romero left Sam Sherman and I guess it was Kane V. Lynn or something from Hemisphere and went to New World. And they started, you know, the women in prison pictures, and they had gotten, I think, Jack Hill in for two of them, and that yep. sort of introduced the world to Sid Haig and Pam Greer. Yeah. So there's yeah. another connection. I'm just sort of uh, dumbstruck by the fact that uh, there has been such little uh, word about him. I mean, he, Nicholas Roeg, for crying out loud, was <laughs> one of the cinematographers on Mask of the Red Death yeah. back in those in the Corman Poe days. It's like the people who have come through his stable are just, they're remarkable. And most of them, if, if, if not all of them, had very little footprints before this guy, you know. The, yeah. the opportunity to work with him. I, I know it's just it's just amazing. And then like he, he, you know, I don't know what happened with Eddie Romero. I don't know if he stopped working for him or not. But he kept, you know, he was staying over there. I mean, he got Ciro Santiago on board. He did a bunch of stuff with him. Then I guess he got Bobby Suarez later on. So he had a huge footprint over there. Plus, you know, it, it's weird. I, you know, you know how I were. I do a lot of research and try to find stuff out. And Corman had his fingers in a lot of other pies. Yeah. He that did. horrible Navy versus the Night Monsters, I think he had something to do with producing it. <laughs> yes, I, re I remember. I saw that not too long ago, actually. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, so did I. And I was like, okay. I remember when I was a kid, I saw the ad mat. I guess it was like mid-60s, and it was only playing in a really bad area. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't go. But then they ran it late at night, and I'm like, hey, this is really scary until you see the fucking monsters. Yeah, that's the th tree stumps. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's not a <laughs> it's good yeah, setup, though. Good setup. And then, you know, there was that period where uh, when he sold uh, New World to uh, those three lawyers <laughs> yeah. who apparently then at some point, I guess it must have been 85 or so, uh, they got into that little tussle there and uh, there was uh, lawsuits between both of them. And uh, eventually they settled that out of court. But he, he, he just kept going. He just kept reforming these companies. What was it? New Concord, the yes. New Horizons. Yes, new. It, it was Millennium. That, that and he said that yeah. he had to change the name because nobody could pronounce it or spell it or knew what it meant. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's like oh, I got to come up with something else. So yeah, Concord. After that, he just he, he just never stopped. No, he never. Then did. he did the whole. I guess the whole deal with Shout Factory. I guess they got most of his stuff, and there's supposedly something going on with his kids that that wasn't supposed to happen. Oh really? Something going on. You know, you know, my beef with Shout Factory is 
they throw out limited runs of these things, only 15, like, okay, Attack of the Crab Monsters was 1,500 copies. Data World Engine was 1,500 copies. That was it. Yeah, that's it. And they're gone. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that sucks because I think, you know, more people would pick this stuff up. Well, you know, going back to Blood Island, you know, I have old prints of that on DVD from, I don't know. Yeah, from of, Image. Yes, from Image. Yeah. And I wanted to find Blu-ray copies of that. Try to do that. I looked on eBay. Oh, I did find the, tr the, 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 the box set. Sure did. $300 on eBay. It's like, oh, come on. Somebody's got to have the licensing again. You can still get Brides and you can still get Mad Doctor on Blu-ray, but the one they didn't Blu-ray was Beast of Blood. They yeah. put it in the box set. Right. And why? Had I had, had I had known that thing was going to go through the roof, I would have bought a couple of them. Oh heck, yeah, of course, you know. But and when they go out of print, they're really, really, really out of print, and it's like hard as hell to find. They limited the run on that, but then they put out the Milligan box set, which didn't do anything. I just saw it for seventy nine ninety five, brand new. So did I. <laughs> on yeah. Hamilton, I think, right? Yeah, I just was there too. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I I bought it already, and it's like I really, you know, Milligan's an acquired taste, and I, it yeah. Really my, you know, the only one I really think that worked for me was Flesh Pond on Forty Seconds. I need to see that. I, I I don't. This guy, he he's a he's a specific sort of auteur, and so I I, I don't know if I've quite acquired the taste yet. Pete Walker, though, I did pick up because that yeah. that's some there's some great stuff in there. You know, with Milligan, the thing is they lost all his sexploitation stuff, I guess, through that whole Michigan thing or something like that. And that's where his strength was. Oh, interesting. The other stuff was just junk because yeah. I watched Flesh Pot and I'm like, okay, I've heard conversations like this going on when I was hanging out back in the day. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty true to life. Yeah. And the other thing too is a lot of Corman stuff, his post stuff is showing up on Kino Lorber. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Because I picked up, what did I pick up? Um, the Raven. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Comedy of Terrors wasn't his though. I, I, I don't know. It wasn't his with somebody else. Right. Great. Because yeah. those things look so good. They they look really good in the day. And, and I know, now I know. they just <laughs> you know, popping. Well, that, that was that was another way they, I, I think I said, I don't know if I said this on this show or not. I said it on the other show. They pulled something where, you know, when I was a kid for, I guess, a spook show or something, five horror happenings mm. for horror films, quote, and this live, you know, Frankenstein and Dracula on stage. Right, right. Well, the first one was Haunted Palace. And I'm like, oh, oh. this is going to be great. Okay, we saw Haunted Palace. The next three were Tales of Terror because there was three segments. Oh, they lied to So we you. were sitting there going, okay, we got fucked. And then when the <laughs> monsters came out, they were pelted unmercifully with anything that couldn't be thrown down, <laughs> nailed down. Yeah, uh, and rightfully so. They got yeah. ripped. That's not right. And, you know, I just saw, I just rewatched uh, Not of This Earth, a, a really wonderful Corman film from uh, the 50s. Yeah. That's a heck of a lot better film than, than uh, people give it credit for, perhaps. It really is quite good and creepy, really honestly yeah, creepy. And there, there was some, I remember reading this, that Corman and Paul Birch had a fist fight at the end of the movie. <laughs> yeah. Now that's not surprising. He looked like he I, could, I, be a, could be a a guy, uh, could be a yeah, character. Yeah, I think he was a heavy drinker too, mm -hmm. uh, Birch. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't he in uh, Day the World Ended? He was in The Day the World Ended, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he yeah. was another one of those players. <laughs> well, it was another thing, too. That, like, you know, here's another another career that, you know, Corman launched. Mike Connors is Touch yes, Connors. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And then I, I think it was, I can't remember the name. I think this guy, Richard Gordon, had a lot to do with casting back then. And he had a soft spot for some of these old timers. So he mm -hmm. basically stuck Raymond Hatton in there as the prospector. Perfect. And then he stuck him in this invasion of the saucer men too, I think. Now that's something that hasn't come out yet. Why? That's because of Susan Hart. Well, it's because of Susan Hart? What happened was the way I understand this whole thing is that she was Jim Nicholson's widow who owned half AIP mm -hmm. and she got a whole handful of films. And unfortunately it's uh, the amazing colossal man, invasion of the saucer man. It conquered the world terror from the year 5,000 and a bunch of other ones. And supposedly she was going to cut a deal with Shout Factory and it hasn't happened yet. So this may be another situation where if she passes away, this shit's lost. Yep. There you go. Uh, there is one quote from Ron Howard that I, I've always loved because, um, well, you know, Ron's done some pretty good work over his life. Uh, <laughs> Corman evidently told him when he was giving him his break for the first time, he said, if you do a good job on this film... 
you'll never have to work for me again. <laughs> yeah. I had heard that, too. That's great. There was another quote from Allison Hayes. I yeah. guess it was because he, he did a couple Westerns with her. Mm hmm. And something must have happened, and she walked up to him. She goes, all right, Roger, who I got to fuck to get off this movie? <laughs> was that an open-door policy? That was. <laughs> I, I don't know. But, well, it was like, it was like uh, I think when Dick Miller originally met him, he goes, uh, all right, uh, I, I'm a writer. And Corbin goes, uh, I, don't, I don't need writers. I'm an actor. He goes, well, now I'm an actor. <laughs> and I think in one of the westerns, he played a cowboy and an Indian in the same it's film. In the same film. Oh, another guy, another guy we missed, Robert Vaughn, teenage caveman. Oh, that's right. You know, God, yeah. it's hard to see him as anything but Napoleon Solo. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Robert Vaughn. Here's an. I, I just came up with this whole thing. Frank DeCova was in that too. Chief Wild Eagle from uh, F Troop. Oh my he god. He was one of the cavemen. And, and the weird <laughs> part was, he was a professor at one point. I think uh, of something out of Brooklyn. No, I was going to say that would be. Yeah, he, you know, then he was a machine gun Kelly too. So mm -hmm. there was a weird, there's a weird demographic with that because I figured out he he worked with Bronson four times. There was this thing called the Mob, and they were both uncredited in in the crowd scene, and they both had a couple lines. Mm -hmm. Then there was Run of the Hour where they were both Indians and loincloths, and I'm like, you know, Bronson was always buff. Yeah, but he so was, was Frank. Mm. And then Machine Gun Kelly, where he was, you know, the, the gas station attendant that he ended up screwing him. Yeah. And then I think it was the mechanic. He was a mob guy and a mechanic. So yep. they were to get that little weird demographic, you know, four times. That's interesting. Think about Corman. I mean, most most people who, if they are aware of him, are probably more aware of him in terms of his, you know, science fiction stuff. But he crossed genres. He didn't care. He, I mean, he just yeah. whatever it was, he he'd go for it. Yeah, another Bobby Bobby De Niro in Bloody Mama. Yes, exactly. You know, the, the really messed up part of it is I remember like, you know, all these guys, you know, I guess uh, how many guys have passed away? And I'm like, he outlived almost most of the guys that he launched when you think of it. You know, I really feel that he was slighted by the industry because he basically created most of the industry himself when you think of it. I mean, you know, all these guys we got. And I just really think it, it sucked that, you know, there was nothing on the news. Corman basically, <laughs> like I said, he created, you know, almost the whole industry. He did. And, you know, most of the people that we've had work in the late 60s up until the mid 80s were his people. Yeah. So, you know, there's a legend and he should be considered a legend. Indeed, he should. Quite a legend and uh, a guy who knew what he wanted, knew how to get there. And did it with what he had. Wow. You know, I, I re seriously, I had no idea he helped those folks, bro. I mean, Ron Howard? <laughs> yeah, 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 you bet. Roger was a, a, a visionary, for sure. He he could see budding talent and knew uh, they, they weren't certainly going to stay around for his projects forever. But most of the folks that are still with us, that uh, he coached, have always had the uh, highest regard for him, uh, even though he, <laughs> he was legendary as being a stickler for the uh, bottom line. Yeah, well, I, I guess that's also how you stick around that many years. Yeah, and he was still working uh, up to the last, as I understand. Yeah, good on him. We'll miss you, Roger. And with that fond farewell to Mr. Corman, we'll take our leave as well, friends, but not before thanking our contributors... Leslie Jane and Gregory Wilson for exquisite ideification mentisms, and 42nd Street Pete for the uh, great remembrance chat there on Roger Corman. Thanks as well to Neil from Ireland for the uh, show title suggestion, and by all means, catch Neil's show as well. It's called Into Your Head, which you can find linked in the show descriptioni. Thanks as well to the always banjaxed Dr. Ibdecibles, Milt Keynes for technical assistance and so forth and so on. Been a true slice. Uh, and folks, if you haven't already, and you know, you really should oughta, head on over to our Patreon page and become a supporting member of this here audio type show thing. Oh yes, you'll get free swag, exclusive content, and early access to shows as well as full instructions on the Fusebox secret handshake. Extra hand not included. Your mileage may vary. Offer not available in Utah. 
That's patreon.com forward slash the fuse box show. Thanks as well to the grainy goodness coming from our friends at Grindhouse Resurrection Magazine. And I hear issue four is rumored to be in the works, but issue three is out now. And uh, it's a barn burner. The cover alone will give you pause. And then a wheezy laugh will emanate from your innards. <laughs> Check it out at 42ndStreetPete.net. Uh, and thanks, of course, to you, friends, for pushing play on this edition of the program. I ain't going to slip you an electric eel here. We'll have a, a, a bit more on the orange guy next time. Some stuff we uh, didn't get to this time, but then other stuff too. I have been your running with scissors while talking with my outside voice inside host, Mark Rose, saying until our next cartoon. <laughs>